You're pregnant or trying to conceive, and you're considering receiving care from an obstetrician. How do you know who to go to when there are so many obstetricians to choose from? What questions should you ask? I'm Abby Lacey, founder of the Doula Initiative, and today we're discussing how to choose an obstetrician that's right for you. This is Preggy Pals. Um, is that a plus sign? Pink or blue? Hospital or home birth? What type of food should I be eating? I think I just peed myself. I'm pregnant and I have to exercise? What, pregnancy glow? Wait, was that a contraction? (laughs) Gotta make these pants fit! I've got cankles! What do you mean there's more than one? You've got the symptoms, and now you've got the support you need for a happy nine months. This is Preggy Pals, your pregnancy, your way. Welcome to Preggy Pals. We are broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. Preggy Pals is your online, on-the-go support group for expecting parents and those hoping to become pregnant. I'm your host, Stephanie Glover. A special thanks to all of our Preggy Pals Club members. Our members get special episodes, bonus content after each new show, plus special giveaways and discounts. See our website for more information. Another way for you to stay connected is by downloading our free Preggy Pals app, available on Android, iTunes, and Windows Marketplace. Sunny, our producer, is now going to give us some information about our virtual panelist program. Yeah, so if you guys are listening and uh, you want to be part of the show, but you're not here in San Diego for some reason, you couldn't make it to our taping today, you can participate through our virtual panelist program. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We are going to be using hashtag PreggyPalsVP. Of course, the VP stands for virtual panelist. And we're going to be asking you guys some questions. So we're asking the panelists right here in the studio. If you guys want to ask our experts some questions, that's a great way to do it as well and just participate in the conversation and help out some other mamas-to-be. So if you are participating, you could even win some great prizes. So please do. (laughs) Great. Thank you, Sunny. So we're going to go ahead and go around the table here and introduce our panelists, introduce ourselves. I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Stephanie Glover. I am 32 years old. I am a stay-at-home mom and host of Preggy Bells. Um, No due date, but I have two little girls. Gretchen is almost three, and she was my C-section baby. And Lydia is 11 months, and I had her via VBAC. Hi, my name is Annie. I'm 36. I'm a labor doula. I have three little girls, a nine-year-old, a two-year-old, and an eight-month-old, Clara, Lucy, and Stella. Clara was a uh, vaginal birth in the hospital. And Lucy was a transfer home birth to the hospital, and Stella was my home birth. I'm Stacy Spensley. I'm 31 years old. I'm a certified holistic health coach, and I am not due yet with anything, but I have one son, Ivor, who is 17 months old, and I had an unmedicated vaginal natural childbirth. Great. Thank you. Um, And I am Sunny. I am filling in for Samantha as producer on today's show. But you guys know me. I've been around the block a couple (laughs) times on these shows. Um, I've got four children currently under the age of four. My oldest is about to turn four, so I can't use that expression for too much longer. Um, My middle guy is two, and I have identical twin girls who are eight months old. Um, My first um, was vaginal, and then I had two cesarean births. Great. Thank you, Sunny. Mm -hmm. So before we get started here, we're um, reviewing a pregnancy app called Full Term Labor Contraction Timer. And um, it's available on iPhone and iPad. And this app um, can time contractions, which can be very helpful when you're in labor. Um, It also provides basic guidelines for the different phases of labor that you can refer to when using the app and kind of compare it to your um, labor pattern. And if you forget to, um, say, hit the stop button after contraction, then you can actually go in and edit um, your input and your entries to, I guess, show an accurate um, account of your contraction patterns. And also you're able to email your um, contraction times with a doula or someone else that you'd like to communicate your labor to. So we'll go around the room and just kind of discuss this app and get some opinions on it. Okay, as a doula, I have to say big love on this app. (laughs) Not only is it free, Uh which who doesn't like the F word? Um, I love the F word. I love the F word. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So not only is it free, but, um, you know, as your doula, if I'm at home or, you know, at work or doing something and you're calling me and saying, hey, we're in labor um, and I have questions, 
and you don't have the answers, great. You know what? If you're comfortable and you don't mind tracking your labor for the next 30 to 60 minutes, track it for me. Send me an email from the app directly that shows me what your progress is and what things look like. You know, as an experienced doula, I can often look at that pattern and have a pretty good idea of what's going on with your with your labor fantastic as a doula question so when like how how easy is it to send to your doula because I'm, I'm thinking okay I'm I'm having contractions I might be in some pain the last thing I want to do is hunt for an extra button to send is it literally like yeah right if, there if you're under the details section there's a big envelope in the top right hand corner you hit that envelope you type in my email address and off it goes directly from the app so is it just what's listed there like the contractions that you've experienced so far that's what it sends or can you isolate it more it'll send the entire history oh, okay okay um so but it'll list it typically with the most recent um pattern at the top of the email and then I can go back and see you know historically what was your pattern how has your pattern been developing um, you know generally speaking I don't like my families later on in labor to be too focused on my contractions are every two and a half minutes and they're 35 seconds long and you know I, at, at some point yeah we don't want you to kind of obsess over having your phone in your hand and tracking when your contractions are starting and stopping but when you're getting the hang of it and trying to figure out if you're even in labor is there a pattern fantastic app and it doesn't cost you a dime love it Annie you've, you've used this right yes it was funny because Abby and I are backup doulies for each other and I had no idea that we both use this app <laughs> uh, but it's not something that we've talked about I just also as a labor doula I found that this is a very effective app um it's very easy and I like the edit function on it because everybody in labor you think one's starting but oh it's not or you you forget to hit the stop button and then it's 30 seconds later and then it's showing that your contractions are two minutes long which they're not (laughs) but yeah that 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 edit function is great it has a graphing function on it so and, and it's hard we were talking about this in a previous episode where they tell you you know, wait to come in the hospital before, you know, wait until your contractions are four to five minutes apart. Well, it's not like it goes, oh, okay, well, now it's five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, four minutes, four minutes, four minutes. It doesn't work like that. It goes like four minutes and 20 seconds and then six minutes and 10 seconds. And it's all over the board. But what you're looking for is the average. And so the nice thing with this app is it already calculates that average for you. Uh, and you can see it either in a table format or you can see it graphically in a chart. And you don't have to remember, is it four minutes from the start to the start of the next one? Is it four minutes from the end to the start of the next one? All you have to worry about is the start button, which turns into a stop button. That's it. It it has mom not thinking so much during her labor. So. Yeah, I like the fact that this app, that's all this app does, because, you know, there's a bunch of different pregnancy apps out there, and this is one of the functions, or it's an upgraded option or something, and for some people, that may be good, but it's been my experience that if you can do one thing and do it really well, then that might be a better option than trying to be all things to every pregnant woman out there. Right. And I also know that when, you know, when you're in labor and you may not be thinking as clearly, it's a lot easier for me to find just, where's that contraction app? Then again, going, oh, here's my favorite pregnancy app, and then scroll here and hit Through this. Through sub- five sub-menus. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Abby, I think you were saying this what, This was developed by a uh, expecting dad, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's my understanding is mm-hmm. he developed this. Um, from my understanding, he's an app developer, and he couldn't find something that he liked, so he decided to write his own and Love used it. it in his own wife's labor. Mm-hmm. All right, so thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs Big up. thumbs up. Thumbs up. up. Mm-hmm. Today on Preggy Pals, we're continuing our series on hiring your care providers. This week, we're discussing how to choose an obstetrician or OB that's right for you. Joining us today is Abby Lacey, founder of the Doula Initiative, a nonprofit organization that provides subsidies and resources to families and doulas. Welcome to Preggy Pals, Abby. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. (laughs) So before we get started, can you explain what an obstetrician is and how they differ from a midwife? Yeah, uh, an obstetrician is uh, a medically trained care provider. Um, Not to say that a midwife isn't, but uh, an obstetrician is an MD who has gone all the way through medical school and has chosen to specialize in pregnancy care and birth. Um, A midwife, uh, so there are a couple of different 
types of midwives, at least in California. There's a certified professional midwife who uh, goes through an entire training program, maybe doesn't have any previous medical experience, but decides to become a midwife. And there's a certified nurse midwife. um, And a CNM is required to actually be an RN before going through their midwifery training. Uh, Midwifery training in that case is an advanced degree. Uh, it's a master's uh, with the option of extending into a doctorate. So um, it just it's different training. It's different schooling. Um, and obstetricians are um, the typical choice of delivering women in the United States. Okay. And we often hear the term OBGYN. Mm-hmm. So what's the difference between an obstetrician and a gynecologist? And are obstetricians usually both? Um, You know, an obstetrician doesn't have to be both. Um, An obstetrician uh, does specialize in maternity care and labor and birth. Uh, A gynecologist specializes in women's reproductive health. They do tend to go very well together, so you will see a lot of obstetricians who are also gynecologists. Um, You also may see gynecologists who are not obstetricians. Typically, if you're an OB, um, adding gynecology to your practice isn't quite as cumbersome um, and can, of course, help grow your patient base. Um, However, if you're just a gynecologist, some of them don't want to take on the additional liability of working with um, pregnancy and birth. Okay. I imagine the time restraint Mm -hmm. as well, you know, with gynecology, there's, you know, well woman care from puberty to, um, you know, old ladies, basically. Yeah. Yeah, But, but birth work, you know, having that obstetrician uh, hat on as well as uh, gynecology, you know, you're getting calls in the middle of the night. And generally with gynecological, this, I can't think of any gynecological emergency. You'd Pretty much any woman would wait for office hours the next day to schedule surgeries if they're needed. Yeah, more often yeah. than not. Yeah. Where do OBs typically practice and where do they deliver? So um, OBs, more often than not, currently are practicing in large group practices. Um, you'll see anywhere from three to 12 obstetricians grouped together in a practice. Um, that's in private care. Um, if you're on the HMO side, um, your doctors also may be in a practice environment. But one of the big differences, for example, between Kaiser and Sharp is if you're in an um, OB practice at Sharp, um, you're more than likely going to wind up with one of the OBs from your group. So there's a chance you've met the provider before versus at um, a a practice uh, with Kaiser, you may be seeing your obstetrician and then show up at the hospital and no one from that office is currently in the hospital and you see an obstetrician who happens to be on call for that shift. Okay. And are there patients that are better suited to receive um, care from an obstetrician um, versus a midwife or? Well, absolutely. If you're considered a high risk pregnancy, um, then an obstetrician is where you need to be. Um, usually that means that there are conditions that are present in your pregnancy that need a, a more managed care as opposed to, um, you know, a little bit more hands off approach that you're going to get from a majority of midwives. So um, particularly high risk. Um, I also tell my clients, really, if you're just more comfortable under obstetric care, um, because one of the biggest keys to birth is trusting that you're in safe hands, feeling good with your provider, and um, going into the birth itself full of confidence. Okay. And now, did um, Stacy or Annie, did either of you have um, obstetric care? I actually, because I had a low-risk pregnancy, um, I did see midwives for my prenatal care, and the OB showed up just in time for the baby to arrive, and since I didn't push very long, almost missed it anyway. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I have three to three, uh, three different pregnancies. So I had obstetrician care at different points of the pregnancy with baby number one and number two. Okay. Uh, so yeah, with number one, it was basically who's covered by my insurance, and I really felt comfortable with um, a woman uh, rather than, than a man. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I chose basically the only... Uh, female obstetrician that was covered by my insurance. That was my decision-making <laughs> process on that one. Uh, so, yeah, and she uh, did all my prenatal care. Uh, yeah, she was there um, just a little bit in the hospital uh, checking on me, and then she was there uh, right before the birth. 
so yeah and then uh with the second baby i um had midwifery care I had hospital midwifery care uh and home birth midwifery care i had dual care um so one was covered by my insurance one was not uh and then when it was time for me to have the baby i, I transferred with my home birth uh, but the hospital that I transferred to, midwifery care is not available 24-7. Uh, so an obstetrician came in uh, basically to to catch the baby and then do the perineal repair. Okay. I, I never met him before. So, uh, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of funny because he was a newer obstetrician uh, just finishing his residency. It was kind of a quiet night. I don't think they were expecting, you know, me to show up. <laughs> um, and I was on all fours. And so he was like, whoa, what's this? <laughs> you know, like, you just, you know, just a different way of practicing. Right. You know, most of women have epidurals and, and they're in. On their back. On, and they're on their back. And that's the way the babies are born. You know, here I come in, you know, cur- cussing up a storm and not getting off my hands and knees. And <laughs> so, yeah. So it worked out okay. So yeah. he, he, you know, he's a young guy, but he rolled with the punches pretty good. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> within obstetrics, are there um, different specialties? Like, are there different types of OBs? Absolutely. So you have some OBs that prefer the lowest pregnancies, and that that's typically what they will work with. Um, you will also have OBs who specialize in the high-risk groups. They're typically referred to as perinatologists mm-hmm. as opposed to just obstetricians. Um, it's not uncommon if you're having multiples or if you have other significant contributing health factors to see a perinatologist. Um, if you have a history of seizures, if you have any heart conditions, um, occasionally if you have um, gestational diabetes, you will be transferred over to care for um, a, with a perinatologist versus an, an obstetric office because they feel like you're in better hands. Okay. You each reference sort of the OBs showing up to catch your babies. They're mm-hmm. baby catchers. So what's the model of care like for an obstetrician? Like how... How involved are they with the prenatal, with like labor and delivery and postpartum? Good question. So the interesting thing about obstetric care is, is that um, we find more and more that it is really kind of guided by what insurance companies will allow obstetricians to do. Um, oftentimes, uh, insurance companies set a, a minimum or a maximum amount of time that an OB is allowed to spend with you per office visit. Um, so... You might not get as much one-on-one time with your OB during an office visit. Um, So the other part of it is that you may find that um, the office practice itself is so busy uh, that they can often get behind. And you wind up spending a decent amount of time sitting in the waiting room to be seen for, you know, maybe five, ten minutes at at most. Um, You're brought back into the office by a nurse or a nurse practitioner who takes your vitals, has a chat with you, you sit, you wait for your OB to come in, they whisk in, talk to you for five minutes, and then they're gone, and you've just spent three hours in the office uh, for five minutes with your care provider. So it it's not necessarily, um, if you want a lot of FaceTime with your doctor, um, the go-to. Um, if you are totally comfortable with that model of care, and um, if that's all your insurance will provide for you, which is really a deciding factor for a lot of women, um, then it, it's just good to be aware that um, obstetricians oftentimes aren't able to provide the one-on-one care. Um, outside of your office visits, um, when it comes time for labor and delivery, again, um, if you're in a group practice, uh, they often have a rotation for who is taking births in the office that day. Um, so you may wind up with your doctor, you may not. Um, you may wind up with someone in their practice who you have met previously. Um, I will say there are exceptions to this rule, and we have a handful of them here in San Diego County. Um, and if you are dead set on having your provider at your birth, um, you need to seek out that provider and not find a group care situation. Well, it's definitely something in the interview process. I feel that women have to do their homework and, you know, don't do what I did for my first birth. I'd be like, well, I want a female and I want my insurance cover. <laughs> you know, I really, was my birth fine? Yeah. Could have been better? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. In a lot of ways. You know, and that wasn't just my obstetrician. That was a lot of choices that I uh, made or, you know, chose not to make <laughs> with regard to childbirth education. Um, 
but yeah, but yeah, that's definitely something. And it's so much easier to do it early on in a woman's pregnancy, Absolutely. going through that interview process and going, wow, am I, do I really click with this person? Or, and as you referred to Abby, okay, great. I click with them. What's the likelihood that they're going to end up as the person mm-hmm. who is there at the birth? Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. And the other thing to note too, is, is that, um, If you feel like you need to be very specific about your provider being at your birth, understand that really the obstetrician is with you not a significant amount of time during the labor and birth itself. Your nurse is the person who spends the the most amount of time with you while they're on shift. That is the person who's going to be really kind of actively involved in managing your care while you're in the hospital. What's you bring the brownies for? Mm -hmm. Exactly. (laughs) One thing I was going to say, one thing that, um, that, I did this is with my my first so I hadn't had a child before and I was with a care provider that they could not guarantee that the person that had been seeing me was actually going to deliver the baby and this was a vaginal birth so they didn't know who was you know, when I was going to go into labor and who was going to be on on call and so I took the advice of a friend who was in a similar position and decided that for all of her prenatal appointments she was going to try to see a different provider mm-hmm. each time absolutely and um, that's kind of what what I ended up doing every time that I could I'd see now it made for kind of a weird prenatal appointment each time because <laughs> they're checking you and they're pretty intimate and, and you're not able to really establish a rapport with them. It's kind of a little awkward if you can get past that phase. Um, but I did meet a bunch of different people. It did so happen that when I went into labor, one of the people that I saw one time ended up you know, being there and I was comforted by that. So that yeah. may be an option for people that don't have that that ability if you're an HMO or whatever. You know, can't really make that choice. That, that may be an option for you for your prenatal appointment. Appointments. Absolutely. And it's a great opportunity to have conversations with each of the doctors yeah. in the office and ask them about the things that are important to you. So, you know, is it really important to you not to have an episiotomy? Well, they're not standard anyway, but if that's the one thing that's really important to you. If that's the hill you're going to die on. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> ask, ask the doctor every visit that you have. Mm-hmm. You know, ask, ask each doctor if there's something that's just really important to you. Ask them. Yeah. Well, I know here locally in San Diego, there's a birth center that they do that as a standard of practice where you see a different midwife every time Mm -hmm. because you don't know who's going to be on call. I imagine there'd be groups of obstetricians that, you know, they can't force that on you, of course, but maybe they could encourage that and say, look, we don't know who's going to be there. So why don't you see a different provider every time? You know what? For for my situation, the receptionist gave me a weird look every time I tried to schedule. Really? Why? I don't understand why, what, you know, you've been assigned this person. I'm like, no, like, I don't know who's going to be there. And Mm -hmm. But they didn't get it. Yeah. And every time I saw a new obstetrician, they're like, so wait, you didn't like your last one? I don't I don't huh. know why, you know. And they would go through it each time. I'm like, don't you understand? Like, this is a personal <laughs> experience. And I want to know who is staring at my vagina for four or five hours, whatever. You I, did, know? I did the yeah. same thing. And, and when um, – and actually, it was one of the first midwives. I saw a nurse practitioner for my original appointment, and they don't deliver babies anyway. So then I, when I was seeing a mid, the midwife the first time, then in her own words, well, it doesn't matter who you see for your prenatal care because it has no bearing on who's here, who's going to be there when you deliver. And I didn't like her anyway. <laughs> so, I, so I called back. And I, I only caught, cried three times when I was pregnant, and that was the first time. And in the car on the way home, I was, like, hysterical because I'm like, honey, I'm going to cross my legs and never have the baby if she's the one who's there. (laughs) So so I called back, and I was like, well, I need to change my appointment. They're like, okay, a different time, different day. I'm like, just a different provider. They're like, you know, do do you have somebody in mind? I said, anybody but her. (laughs) (laughs) And they were like, uh okay (laughs) and of course so I went through I think four other care providers just because again I rotated through and I found one that I liked and so I did stick with her for the last like three appointments and of course who was there when I delivered oh no one I didn't like oh Oh, no Mm -hmm. luckily luckily I chose an excellent doula and I was only there for two and a half hours and it didn't matter but (laughs) but still great segue so when we come back we'll discuss how to find an obstetrician that matches your care preferences we'll be right back Welcome back. Today we're discussing how to find an obstetrician for your prenatal care and delivery. Labor doula Abby Lacey is our expert. So for a first time mom, where do you even begin when you're trying to find an obstetrician? So I always tell families who are newly pregnant, the first thing is to decide what kind of birth you want to have. 
And really because your care provider is going to make or break your experience. And um, when you're deciding what kind of experience you want to have, that's going to help point you in the direction of the obstetrician who's going to really feel more comfortable for you. So start with deciding, um, do I want really unmedicated hands-off care or do I want the epidural in the parking lot? You know, that kind of thing. And then um, once you've established what kind of birth experience you think you want to have, then I encourage you, start talking to people. Start talking to other people who've had babies recently because let me tell you, practices change in a matter of a couple of years. So if, if it's five or more years old, Um, probably don't it's great to consider their opinion but uh, obstetric practice changes very very rapidly if you try and keep up with ACOG and their position changes um, and what is ACOG? ACOG is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology they're the ruling body for obstetricians Um, and and they put out position papers like it's going out of style so um, you know even for an obstetrician to keep up with the changes in practice it can take a little while for them to implement changes Um, but you know obstetric practice can change fairly quickly um, even though you would think we've been having babies for how many thousands of years so um, any anyone who's had a baby you know five years or recent more recently um, I would maybe talk to them find out what kind of birth they had what their experience was with their provider what they were looking for because you would be surprised when you talk to your girlfriends um, how varied the idea of a perfect birth is Um, so definitely ask around talk to your friends who've recently had babies and what their experience was what their preferences were um, if that provider was accommodating to those things Um, you know, get on, get online, do Google searches, research your doctor. I, you know, one of the things that always surprises me, uh, people do more homework on what car they're going to buy than they do on the doctor who's going to help bring their child into the world. So, um, do a little bit of homework on your doctor. Don't just look at whether or not that doctor is covered by your insurance. Absolutely. That's important. See what providers are available underneath your coverage and then, Go to town, do some homework on this person because they're going to be in your personal business and they're going to create memories that you're going to have for the rest of your life that they may remember for a week. It's, I mean, it, it's a tough truth, but it really is the reality. They see how many patients in a year. They've seen birth over and over and over again. Um, this is what a one, two, three, four time experience in your life. And, you know, Um, make sure that this is someone that you really absolutely adore and that you want to go back to. Well, and that's something to bring up too. We're talking about, you know, making sure that you and your doctor that you've chosen are on the same page. But if you find out later on, kind of tagging on to what Sunny's saying, if you're finding out later in your pregnancy that, you know what, this isn't a good fit anymore, women should not be afraid to change that care practitioner to someone that they feel is more in line with what they want for their birth, what they want for their child. Um, because you know what? I, and I, you know, I understand. I totally get it. Like you feel like you have a relationship with this doctor. Uh, you don't want to hurt their feelings, but you know what? Trust me, you are not hurting their feelings. You know, you are, you are maybe preventing, um, you know, something, you know, um, I don't want to say bad from happening, but you're looking for the best outcome for you and your baby. And if you're feeling in your gut that that's not going to happen with this person, you're not going to hurt their feelings. Just change to someone else. Yeah, no. Nope. Trust yeah. your mommy intuition. Yeah. You know, we were talking about, Annie brought up changing healthcare providers. Um, but when you're trying to make that decision and finding really the one that's right for you, are you able to meet with them, like have interviews with them and is that like what are those called is that covered by insurance are they free to get a good feel for if you want to continue your care so most obstetricians won't necessarily do what they would what you would consider a traditional interview Um, They will want you to come in for an initial visit. Um, So you get an experience of what their care is typically like by going in for that initial visit. Um, They do get a little bit more time on your first visit for some of that intake so that they will ask a little bit more about your medical history, about what you're looking for, about all of those kinds of things. But I would expect to go in and pay your copay for
for what you would typically pay for an office visit. And if that first office visit doesn't go well and something doesn't sit right for you, move on. Go. Don't schedule another visit with the practice. If they call you to remind you that you need to make an appointment, say, you know what, thank you so much, but I have decided to take care with someone else. What are some key characteristics? I mean, I know you talked about asking yourself the type of birth that you want. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, questions that you think are just imperative to ask a potential obstetrician? 100%. So we know nationally that our C-section rate is approaching 40%, um, and it's climbing every year. So if you're really concerned about C-sections, you need to know what your obstetrician's C-section rate is. If you're in a group practice, you need to know what the group practice's C-section rate is. You also need to know what that C-section rate is at the hospital that you plan to deliver at, because if it just so happens that nobody from that practice is available, they may pull someone from a different practice, and all of the um, all of the care providers together who have privileges at a hospital contribute to making that hospital c-section rate so always 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 ask what the c-section rate is um, at your office um, ask the um, office staff what the, what's the wait time how long am i going to have to wait to be seen when i come in does the doctor run late often um, does the doctor deliver all their own babies um, if you wind up in a practice where the obstetrician does deliver all of their own patients you're going to have a wait time. I guarantee you it's just going to happen. Or you may have to reschedule your appointment. So if you're someone who um, is extremely busy, has a very rigid schedule, and you know that you need to be seen on time on a specific day, um, you a group practice, a large group practice might be better for you. Um, but if you're adamant that you want your care provider to um, be the person who delivers you, expect to have a wait time. Um you may want to ask in the case that you're with a provider who delivers all their babies, how many patients do they accept around your due date? Are they really super busy? Is it going to be difficult? Will they vaginally deliver breech babies? Is it a very important question because that is not a standard of care. Um, and most most obstetricians won't. And, um, you know, it's good to know, is your obstetrician one of them? And how long will they go before they consider an induction? Well, that's mm -hmm. a good one, yeah. too. My yeah. friend's sister just had a baby in Tennessee, and they were talking at, like, 38 weeks, and we were all just like, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Abby. Absolutely. Um, for more information about Abby Lacey and the Doula Initiative, as well as information about any of our panelists, visit the episode page on our website. This conversation continues for members of the Preggy Pals Club. After the show, Abby's going to be discussing changing obstetricians mid-pregnancy. To join our club, visit our website, newmommymedia.com. We've got a question from one of our listeners for one of our experts. Hello, my name is Andy, and I'm currently 23 weeks pregnant with my first child due this August. I had a question regarding going through a miscarriage, the similarities to giving birth. I'm wondering because I previously miscarried around 10 weeks, though the baby had no heartbeat around 8 weeks. I experienced menstrual-like cramping that over a couple of days got more and more painful and the blood flow that followed the same pattern. Eventually, the pain was constant and I could no longer talk through it. I was at a friend's house that evening. I went up to her bathroom and just tried to make it through the waves of pain that were coming back to back. I started to wonder how long it was going to last and then I began to cry a little, mostly about the unknown of when it would stop. After about half an hour, tissue passed. I felt it leave and I immediately felt better. So now I'm pregnant with a healthy girl and wondering how similar the experience will be to my daughter's birth. I'm hoping for a med-free delivery, which is why I'm thinking about this. Thank you for your time, Andy. Hi, Andy. My name is Dr. Nicholas Kapanakis. I'm a board-certified OBGYN in San Diego, California. Thank you for your question. Uh, I'm sorry that your first pregnancy ended in a loss, but I'm excited for you that uh, things seem to be going well with your uh, baby this time. Uh, to answer your question... Um, it is difficult to say exactly how intense having a miscarriage is with how intense uh, delivering a full-term baby is. I will tell you that the process is very similar. As you described, having the cramps um, for several days uh, is, is very common. The only thing I will tell you with delivery of, of a full-time baby or full-term baby is that those waves that you felt may last longer as far as hours and also as far as time and minutes. 
meaning that most first-time mamas, um, their labor and delivery might be around 24 hours. Now, that doesn't mean that the intensity is always there, but that frequency will build till about every four, four minutes. Uh, the contractions will last about a minute uh, until you deliver. Uh, obviously, after your water breaks, you will feel more intensity, but I would say that the experience is, is, is similar. Uh, I, I do recommend if you're planning an unmedicated delivery to take extra courses, whether that's, you know, birthing from within or hypnobirthing or Bradley. These courses will help prepare you. Also consider uh, hiring a doula. Doulas are excellent help and can help you through that process. Hope that answers your question. Good luck. I know you can do it. Um, and uh, congratulations again. Thanks. Bye-bye. That wraps up our show for today. We appreciate you listening to Preggy Pals. Don't forget to check out our sister shows, Parent Savers, for parents with newborns, infants, and toddlers, Twin Talks, for parents of multiples, and our show, The Boob Group, for moms who breastfeed their babies. This is Preggy Pals, your pregnancy, your way. This has been a new mommy media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, Please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. New Mommy Media is expanding our lineup of shows for new and expecting parents. If you have an idea for a new series, or if you're a business or organization interested in joining our network of shows through a co-branded podcast, visit newmommymedia.com. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.